Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 122. I'm joined today by the head of sports science at Hartlepool United, Jake Simpson. Jake, thank you for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. It's good to speak to you, Ben. Uh, it's good to, uh, great to have you on, mate, because I've just mentioned before we started recording, I love to get practitioners on at different levels of the game. And I think there's so much great work that goes on in uh, the lower leagues, leagues, League One, League Two, and you guys obviously in National League at the moment, um, pretty high up in National League. So that could be changing soon. But I think it's great to dive into what you guys do. Um, so we're going we're gonna to go into that on the podcast today. But just start us off, mate big part of the podcast your story and your sort of background your career so far which takes you up to your current role yeah no problem um so yeah the age of 16 um i left school um with the dream most teenage boys had and that was to become a professional football player Um, i started off at blackburn rovers as a yts um, and then moved on and had two years as a pro at shrewsbury town and stockport county um, Again, that came to an end uh, at the age of sort of 20. Um, and from that point, I had to sort of have a little look at, at where I wanted to go with, with my career, my life. Um, unfortunately, as a, a young lad who, who got his opportunity at football, you don't really have a plan B. Um, you get caught up in, I guess I'd say, your dream, where you want to be, the, the Premier League, the all the, the things that go with that. And then when you sort of are back back out of the game you have to you have to switch on pretty quick to what people call the real world um, and work out what direction you want to go so at the age of 20 I sort of looked back on my time in football um, and although there were some good times it, it's a tough tough world to be in um, and I looked back at times that I had at Blackburn and at Shrewsbury when unfortunately I was injured um, and I'd been working with people like Russ Wrigley, who's still there at Blackburn Rovers now, and Callum Walsh currently uh, with Huddersfield. Um, and I really enjoyed the, the work that we did together um, off the pitch um, because there's a different side of football that was quite new at the time um, in, in regards to sports science, the fitness side of things. Um, and I took a real interest into that um, and I found it really intriguing. I, I, I like the fact I actually knew nothing about it um, and I really wanted to get to know more. I didn't like the feeling of being clueless on that subject. Um, and that led me originally to become a personal trainer. Um, so I did my personal training qualifications. I went into gyms and I, I ran my own business, worked every day, hour after hour with different people, different population groups. And basically that gave me my first exposure to coaching, uh, different to what I do day to day now, but it gave me a real insight into the coaching side of things. Um, and, and again, my, my hunger to know more became quite clear to me and I didn't want to work in a gym forever. I wanted to eventually get back into this elite sport environment that I'd, I'd once been in as a player. Um, so that led me to look into my university studies. I went and did a, an undergrad in sports rehab at the University of Cumbria. And that then led me on to my master's in strength conditioning at University of Salford. Um, and throughout that, I really enjoyed all the studies. I was trying to do as much as possible in terms of placements. Uh, I was working with Carlisle United at the time under Neil Dalton and Lee Fern, uh, when Keith Curl was the manager and doing all my placement hours, working yeah, they all doing the voluntary stuff, doing the long slog where you're going to uni, you're coming back, you're doing days in the club, you're not getting any financial reward for it, but it gives you the best insight possible um, to understand what you're actually getting yourself in for. Um, during my time at Carlisle, um, Lee Dykes was the assistant manager, uh, first team coach at the time. And he actually gave me my reference for my first permanent job, which was down at Chesterfield uh, under Jack Lester. He passed my name on. I went and met Jack um, and I started, I think I went and met him on the Wednesday and I was starting on the Thursday. So literally I had to up sticks from Carlisle where I was living, moved to back to Derbyshire where my mum and dad were based, started my job. Um, and once again, I was pretty much chucked in at the deep end. Um, I met a club that at the time was struggling. We had a real scrap on our hands. Um, and from Chesterfield, I then moved on to AFC Fylde where I worked with Dave Challoner for the first time, who then has now taken me up to Hartlepool United um, in the role that I'm currently doing. 
Um, so yeah, it's been a bit of a, a bit of a whirlwind in terms of where I've come from to where I've ended up. But ultimately, I had from leaving full time playing football, I had this drive to get back to the elite uh, environment that I currently work in, um, and I had to put a plan in place to, to get those steps taken so that I was in the best position and I became an effective part of a, a group of staff, which hopefully um, the reference that the gaffer has brought me up here, he obviously feels I've, I'm a big part to play in his backroom staff. Yeah, brilliant. It's interesting to hear that transition from, from playing to coaching. And one thing I was going to ask was what you, you kind of mentioned it there with the interest and some sort of intrigue into sports science and, and S and C, but why, that route rather than the technical side? Yeah, it's something that I mean, we spoke briefly in the build-up to this. It's something I actually never really thought of in, in the terms of why was it one or the other. Um, again, we talked about that. I had a real intrigue from the work that I'd done during some, some injuries that I'd had. Um, but again, I think if I'm to be completely honest, I was realistic in terms of my age and my experience that I came out of football. So I was still very young. I was 20, 21 year old. Yes, I'd played the game, but again, I want I need to make it clear that just playing the game gives you no right to then have roles within it, whether it's a technical coach, whether it's a sports scientist, whether it's a, a goalie coach. It's, it's not a, a given right. You don't really get the, the knowledge set required to become a coach. It's a completely different um, field. So at my age and at my experience, I had to basically put a plan together of where I felt was the best possible chance of me getting to where I wanted to be um, the technical side isn't something I ignore um, I'm currently in the process again in my UA for B um, but again it was it was probably a bit of realistic thinking in me saying what can I do to get where I want to get and ultimately how quickly can I get there mm. um, and that's what led me along with the interest along with my desire to know more and, and learn and, and go back to academic studies which I'd always been okay as a teenager because I wanted to be a footballer, but I always did well at school and it was something that I had a real strong desire to get back involved in. Um, and it was just, again, the, the long-term plan that I had was to be in the sports medicine, sports science um, side of the game. And what about, so you mentioned there about, obviously, you were young when you came out of the game in terms of the playing side and, and stepped into the coaching side, but there must be some positives from you experiencing going through the, the youth set up and getting into the professional environment that you taken over possibly into your coaching practice. Yeah, definitely. Like I say, I think it's quite easy and probably a lazy way of thinking is oh, I've played the game. I should be able to get a job because that, that's not, that's not the way it works. You've got to have a lot more, one about you and also a lot more in your toolbox, if you like, to actually make a success of it. So I guess one, one positive is I've been a player. So at times during seasons, during different periods that you have in your career, I understand what players are going through. Um, unfortunately, I was out of the team quite a bit. Um, so I understand what goes with that. I understand how you're working day in, day out to be a football player, but you're actually not getting the opportunities to go out and play the games. So I understand that when we as uh, sports scientists, practitioners, S&C coaches ask them to do the work, but all they want to do is play football. Um, so I understand that. And although, again, as a now a sports scientist, I have to ensure that I look after the players and condition them as best as possible. I also have a, a little inkling into the conversations that we need to have in order to get them mentally right for that. Um, it's not always easy. Sometimes you have to just hold your hands up and say, look, I know what you're thinking. You don't want to do this, but it's only to benefit you. And, and it's only here to, to help you affect us as a group and as a team now. So I think those are one thing that one thing that I have took over and I, I do use probably day in, day out is trying to understand the, the psychological side of things with a player. Um, but also, I guess I, I sort of had my eyes open to most sides of football. Um, again, we're just touching it. You think you've seen it all and then something else happens. So you, you soon have to learn to adapt to that situation as well. But um, again, I, I do have quite a, 
an open mindset in terms of the good and the bad. Um, so I guess you kind of you try not to get caught off guard. You try and be able to adapt to everything that's thrown at you. Um, but then I guess, again, looking more so, I do have some tactical understanding. I do have, um, I've been in a team where you're given instructions, you know the roles of different positions on a pitch. But again, I, I'm also very wary that I'm not a technical coach. I'm not a tactical coach. It's, it's not really me, my job to pass opinion on anything outside of my sports science department. Um, but again, it, I think as far as, behind the scenes in the group of staff. I know the manager trusts my opinion. Um, I'd like to think the coaches do as well. Um, but again, it's also a very fine line that I have to step in terms of it's it's not really for me to, to pass too much opinion on that. I will pass it if I'm asked. I'll be very respectful of what's going on around me because, again, my job is head of sports science, so I should really, if you like, stay stay within my remit and only help out when needed to. So there definitely is some benefits. Um, but again, it's not a case of, well, I've been a player. I should just definitely get a job in football, whatever I fancy doing. It's far from that. Um, it's something that, that you have to be very wary of and, and almost stick to, stick to what you're here for, if you like. Yeah, definitely. I think you used a really key word in that in terms of like the team dynamics and the coach team dynamics is is the respect isn't it that yeah you've played yeah you you probably understand a hell of a lot of the sort of positional demands and um you'll understand the game but you've got to respect the the roles of your your um the other coaches yeah definitely i think we've got we've got a good group at the minute um and to be fair, i've been lucky to work with some some good groups of staff with a lot of experience in the game um, again, the manager, assistant, first team coach, goalie coach have all played. Well, I wouldn't even like to know the number of games they've played between themselves. So there's a lot of experience there of the playing side of things. But again, I think it's it's a respect that I think the players will probably have as well um, for the staff where they know it's, again, careful of not falling into the laziness of we've played so we know what we're talking about. But I have conversations with players around play inside of things. What happened when when I played? What the, the gaff has it with when he played? And, and the games changed massively, but they have a respect that ultimately at one point in our career, we were professional athletes as well. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot that goes with that that sort of people don't see. Um, and it's again, it's it's a, it's a, almost a common ground, which I think we've got quite, quite nice here at, at Hartlepool at the minute where we can all have open conversations about experiences, about opinions, about different things that are happening in our league, the Premier League, Championship, whatever it might be. We've all got um, a respect for each other, players to staff, staff to play as well. We can have those open and, and good conversations that sometimes need to be had. This is probably quite a tough question to answer, but do you think that players are maybe a little bit more receptive to the message and, and some of the training principles that you're trying to put across because they know that you've been in their shoes? Um, I hope so. Um, again, it's not something I've ever sort of, of, of thought about in a way because, again, I've been quite lucky or I've, however you want to look at it, where I've always seemed to have got a bit of the complaints from the lads, to be fair. I've never touch wood and had a, a situation where you have someone refuse or you have someone mm. really sort of kick up a fuss about any of the work we're doing. I think my big thing that uh, I learned through studies, through the experiences that I did on placements and stuff is if the players know why they're doing it, I think generally, again, if you can back up the why, mm. they don't have any issues with it. So we're, we're, we're very keen on making sure the lads realise we're not doing anything for the sake of it. We're not doing anything as a punishment. So the physical side of our work isn't a punishment. It's all basically for us to be better as a group. So whether it's the, the t for today, for example, which has been a tough physical day, they understand we're, we're trying to get them to the best possible position for us to be successful as a group. Because again, the level we're at, everyone is ambitious. Everyone wants to improve, we want to play at a better level with Hartlepool United and possibly away from Hartlepool United. So if the lads are all understood that we're not doing anything as a punishment, we're not doing anything just for the sake of it because we did it 10 years ago, 20 years ago in some of the other staff's uh, case, 
we're trying to do things to the best to obviously help them and, and further their careers as well. Then we have, we've had the uh, compliance and we've had the buy-in from the lads to sort of, in a way, head down and let's get on with it. And when it's hard, we know it's hard for a reason. And, and there is also times when we look after them because we also know how important family time, downtime is as a footballer. And you spend plenty of time away from your loved ones. So when we get the opportunity, we, we like to sort of give them chance and, give them the opportunity to spend time away from the place as well. Yeah, and that's definitely important this year, especially, isn't it? With the we were just talking again before we started recording, fixture congestion, which come up time and time again on the podcast, but it's because this year is is pretty crazy. Um I know your league in particular there's all sorts of fixtures. Um some teams have played quite a few games some teams have played hardly any games so the fixtures are all over the show aren't they so that becomes a really important side of it doesn't it to keep that freshness amongst players yeah definitely and like I say it's 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 a mad time we're in and um, again try not to to moan and complain because again there's a lot of people in a lot worse situations than football at the minute and um, so again it's it's always important to remember the human aspect of football, I think. Um, I've seen it from my side of things and growing up, my, my dad was involved in football for years. So I've seen how tough it can be. I've seen how lonely it can be at times when you're in hotel rooms and, and you're sort of backwards and forwards. And we're asking lads not to be travelling distances, going home as much as they maybe would like to, staying in hotels, because ultimately... Their safety is important, but we almost have a bit of a responsibility um, because we've been given the opportunity to carry on. We have to still do it right. Um, But again, there's so much of a human side of football that often gets ignored, I guess, in the mainstream media, not in in sort of day-to-day working of a football club, but it it can be tough at times. So making sure that they're right mentally, that they've had the time with kids, wives, girlfriends, whatever it might be they want to do on their days off that that's as important to footballers as it is any other um, person who has a different job, different um, industry they work in. So, yeah, like I say, it's it's tough at the minute, but we, we're very careful not to complain because, again, we could be in a lot lot worse positions. Yeah, definitely. One thing I wanted to do, Jake, on this was um, give the listeners a bit of a, a day in the life. Uh, and I know yeah. this could be interesting. It could go anywhere depending on what day it is, but... Um, I think it's a really interesting one because um, obviously being in the National League, being a full-time professional outfit, like it'll be interesting just to see some of, some of the sort of responsibilities from your point of view that you have. Um, so do you want to just take us through a bit of a, a rough average day? Yeah, of course. So yeah, like I say, this, this could be different one day, Tuesday, whatever day we're in, something else gets thrown on your lap. But um, I think generally... Um, we like, to, we like to keep things quite consistent. So when we get to work in the morning as a group of staff, we'll have a meeting with regards to the session of the day, uh, what we want from it, the, the sort of physical targets that we're trying to meet, whether that be external load type of session, uh, um, duration, whatever it might be we want from the day. We make sure everyone's clear on that from uh, the manager, myself, the goalkeeper coach, obviously, so he can plan his logistics of the session. The physio has his input. Um, and then we are we're quite we, we pride ourselves as a group that we like to be organised. We like to be set up so when the lads come in, they don't see us rushing around. They don't see us trying to quickly chuck cones on the pitch to set things up. We like to have that all done for when the lads start to arrive in. Um, and I think that always gives us a chance then to get around the group, have a little chat, have, have a, I guess a bit of the banter that you hear about around a football club, which I think is important, especially from my side of things, gauging what the lads are like trying to get without going in and going how do you feel like you saw get an idea of where the lads are physically mentally is, is there anyone who you're looking going oh he's sat in a corner today what's up with him it gives you a nice nice probably half an hour of time while lads are sort of pottering around activation stuff to to have a little chat with people get get to know them get get to know where their heads at for the day before we then go out and do the do the warm-up um, so obviously my, my main role in terms of the session becomes the warm-up and I like to structure that dependent on where we are in the week what the focus of the session is are we going to sprint them that day do we need to prepare for that are we doing anything in particular that we need to be wary of so I need to add in that to the warm-up um, 
so that's the first part of the day, I guess, gets through to the warm up of the session. And then ultimately I'm in and around it again, probably again, take the mickey out of a few of the lads a bit too much and, and have a laugh with them <laughs> around the training yeah. session. But ultimately my, my role there is to be, to be keeping on top of the live, live feedback on the data side of things. So making sure we're not doing anything we hadn't planned for. If there's anything that we need to be aware of on certain individuals, if we've got lads returning from injury, is it to the point where that they've got everything they need? Um, so again, the club have supported us and given us a system where we can use that live feedback. And, and again, we, we try not to let it drive and completely control our, our work, but we use it in a way where we have to make decisions based around what we're seeing. Um, so again, that, that's my main role within the session. Um, following that, at the obviously times at the minute are a lot different but ideally we'd then have our post-session works so whether that be in the gym or be it at the minute that that becomes a lot more difficult and and uh, the group inside of things and using outside space becomes um, a lot more um, difficult in terms of planning that we do some work after the session it might be with a set group it might be a certain aspect of their strengthening program that they need to do on that day um, and that generally takes us to just after lunchtime. Um, and that's when I would sit down and start the report inside of things. Has the day gone as planned? Do we uh, need to pick anything up the following day that we've missed out? Is something gone off plan and we need to adjust the whole week? So again, that, that's where we sort of have a look over the day. Um, and as a group, we've got a database which we keep on top of with all the load data where we know what each drill is going to give us and and how much we need to do for each day to get what we want. So again, as a group, we try and, and use that time after work, after the session to organise again, keep everything on top of. Um, and then it's my role to, to feed back and outline any changes to the guidelines for the following day, really. Um, so I guess you start planning for um, the next day again. Uh, and I guess in football, you are quite repetitive. You, you come in, you set up, you do your session, you report back. Um, but ultimately, it's with the, the long-term plan that we've got as a group of staff of where we want the season to go in terms of physical um, output and physical side of things and linking that into the fact that, again, it's more than every Saturday we have to prepare the lads for at the minute, but every game we have, are we in the best possible position to play the way the manager wants to, safely in a way that we're not putting the lads at risk? Um and ultimately making sure we are doing our best by the squad that we've got to keep everyone out and available. Um, so I guess that that's the the day-to-day -day side of things, but um, you then get the fact that we don't have a full-time kit man. So we then sometimes have to go and do any of the washing back at the ground. We've then got all the different things of if we're at a different site, so we don't have a 3G at our main training base. So if we're on the 3G the following day, we have to pack the van up, get all that stuff over to the ground and, and organise that side of things. So again, you have to be ready for, for anything that's chucked at you um, in terms of, again, it's probably not on my job description, but washing the bibs, getting everything organised, making sure that the, the changing rooms are, are left, left respectable after each game and all these sort of things that, as a group, we are, we're all very open to the fact that we always use the word we're a Division 5 club, so we've got no airs or graces about us if we have to get our hands dirty and clean up after each other and, and make sure that, that we try and leave, we try and run an elite environment um, because we don't have the manpower that you see the Premier League teams have and, and, and things like that, but ultimately we've got a group of staff who are honest, we are, work hard and, and we're willing to do everything we can, so when the players walk through the door, they don't know where they are. They're in an elite environment that we want to create to, to basically push our performances to the to the standard of league we want to be in. Um, and that's no disrespect for the league we're in at the minute. Um, but we all have aspirations to to move forward and move up. And we have to make create an environment that, that allows us to do that. And that might be doing things that your job description doesn't mention, but it, it, we know it's done for the best of our group of players. And all the things you've mentioned there are just all um, contribute into the culture of the club and the squad, aren't they? Like in terms of hard work, in terms of sort of rolling your sleeves up. And that's only going to carry over to, to performance as well. But one thing I was going to sort of pick out that you mentioned was 
the organization side of things or having things set up when the players come in, not just for the fact that it looks good and obviously it saves on a bit of time when the players get there, but the fact that you can then interact with the players and you're not sat behind a laptop or you're not putting cones out when the players are there. Like that must be a really important thing for you to, when we talk about buying, when we talk about relationships, that's, that must be an important time that you can build that. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, I think again, you talk again, listening to people speak and reading things that, that we all look into, there's, there's sort of two ways you can go about that, that side of things. So we've all, heard of wellness uh, checks and and you can use apps now where they literally press a button and you can maybe get them to fill a form in in the morning from personal experience I find out so much more and probably the honesty that comes with it from actually just going and speaking to people Mm -hmm. so if I'm running around after myself in the morning and the lads are coming in and I'm busy setting up a warm-up then I ultimately lose an opportunity to, to find out where our players are at for the day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could get them to fill a form in. Do they really pay attention to that? Do they really give an honest opinion or do they say what we they think we want to hear or do they say what they want their day to look like? So if I tell them I'm tired today, will I get anything adjusted? Well, again, I think you'd be very, it'd be very rare to find someone who gets a wellness check in the morning and, actually has the time to genuinely affect the session for the day for that person to probably stay at a minimal risk if you like to to think of it that way so for me and for my experiences that if I can go and be in and around the activation uh, area that we set up that we've got the the glute bands and there might be an individual in there that doesn't normally come in and he's foam rolling he's stretching and I'll that, that straight away tells me that something's different today. So I found out without asking him, I haven't gone in and said, oh, can you rate your muscle soreness for me today? Straight away there in a, am I sore actually? Where's the sore? What's this? I can see that Joe Bloggs doesn't normally come in foam roll in the morning. So mm-hmm. what's different today? That's a conversation starter. That opens my eyes to how he's feeling. Or you come in and somebody's wrapped up and, and again, sat in the corner, maybe not particularly doing much. And again, it turns out his, his little ones had him up all night and he's, he's shattered and he just needs a little quiet corner because he's hardly slept all night. These are the things that I think that time where you could easily have a coffee all morning and shoot out at quarter to 10 before you start and quickly chuck your combs down. But I think it loses a massive part of our day um, where, again, it's not just myself. The coaches are doing the same. You, the, the physio's in and around his room doing what he needs to do. That social side of things and that, I guess it becomes an openness and an honesty thing where you yeah. can have a conversation with anyone that walks through the door, then that is a massive positive for us as staff to understand where the group is because there's a lot of days where it is pretty normal and there's nothing really to report back on and, and brilliant, but it's the days where there's something you don't quite expect. There's a little feeling around the place. There's there's maybe a couple of individuals that aren't quite themselves. And and sometimes it just gives you a, an opportunity to go and have a chat with them. And they might tell you there's nothing. And you just, you've, you've thought too much. That's brilliant. You crack on as normal. But there might be the one time where they do explain to you that the little one's been ill or they've not really slept very well or the, mist, uh, the mum's been on the phone they're not very well and things like this which again goes back to the human side it's understanding them and almost having a care and not just putting them as a number on a sheet and well their wellness was a number five today well find out why find out that why the person themselves is coming to work not quite at their top level and, and try and have a human aspect to it as opposed to just being stuck to forms and and apps and data that ultimately do we do you really use them as effectively as you could anyway so that's my opinion on it. Um, there's obviously a lot of research into the other, the, the data side of things. But for me, and I guess maybe it is the level we're at, I think the human side of things is massively underrated. It, it's so important to understand what your players are thinking on a day-to-day basis. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'd rather have a conversation with a person about like what's been going on rather than just filling out a form, wouldn't we? I suppose the side of it that a lot of people would would sort of refer back to filling out forms or using apps or whatever is the scale because you've got to cover uh, uh, maybe 20, 30 players in, in that day. So 
for you, like, I know you've got that time, you can get around as many players as you can, but are you just, are you sort of scanning the, scanning all the players to see the players that you're going to target? Like, what I'm trying to say is how do you cover everyone if you're not, if you're not do, focusing so much on the forms? And I fully agree, by the way, that the, the personal side of the conversation is, is far more important. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Like I say, I'm in a in a situation at the minute where we've got a squad. I believe there was 26 trained today, so we've still got a decent group that are coming into work every day. Um, and again, I think the the important thing is you get to know people's habits, people's routines. Um, so there's a lot of people that are, are very low maintenance. They don't need a, a lot of talking to. They don't need a lot of uh, sort of love and care and an arm around the shoulder a lot. There's people that you can pretty much hang your hat on nine times out of ten. They come in, you know what you're going to get from them. Um, and I guess that that's the way where you then have a, a little bit of um, you fine tune your attention, if you like. So you're looking for anything different. You don't. Sometimes you don't have to look at the whole group individually. You don't have to look at every single person. Um, on an isolated basis but again like I said there might be a dynamic in the group that's different there might have been something that happened the day before where there's still a little bit of an edge about the group where mm. people aren't quite talking or it might be something really simple and, and sometimes a little bit pathetic at times which maybe is is playing playing part of the, the dynamic of it also I think yeah as a as a as a group and as a squad it's a case of overseeing it all so having a look at everything that's going on and then there'll be one or two things that might catch your attention that maybe need a little bit more digging on it might be a only one person who you think maybe needs that little chat that little arm around your shoulder and it's trying not to make it obvious it's not going over and saying look is everything all right you know is what what's wrong it's not a case of that it's just again making conversation with people having a mm -hmm. chat and and just making it clear that we all care for the players we all care that we want them to be happy. We want them to feel good. We want them to be fresh. We want them to be fit. But again, is there anything we can do to make them feel that little bit better? Because again, you'd like to think nine times out of 10, the group as a whole comes in, you know what you're going to get, you know what you're going to be doing. Um, but again, it's, it's that consistency. It's those habits, those individual traits that you're looking for is, has something changed today from normal? And if so, is, is there a reason for it or, is it just one of those days? Because we do have them. We all have yeah. them. When yeah. you come in and you're not quite your, your top form, and it might be something as simple as that, but it's, it's trying to get a, a gauge of the habits and the different ways that the, the group works um, and basically trying to see any changes that might happen on a day-to-day -day basis for me. And that's my, that's my opinion on it anyway. Yeah, brilliant. And then what about um, sort of getting key tasks for yourself? So how do you identify or prioritize key tasks that you're going to try and carry out per day, but also thinking a bit longer term for like the season ahead. Um, again, there's, I always, I always, again, things because there's so many ways that people work. There's so many different methods people sort of use and, and different things they call upon to get to where they want to do. But I also always feel that, we all really have the same goals in terms of what we're looking for. So we want our players to be available. We want them to be fresh and we want them to be robust to deal with what we're going to ask of them. And for me, and again, from what I've learned and, and worked at over the, my career as a sports scientist is can we get the basics right? So can we do the basics, the, again, the 90% as opposed to your 1%, can we get those right first? And that might be that each day of the week has a slightly different focus, but ultimately they all piece together to put us in a position for Saturday. Um, and like I said, that, that's what I feel is the priority. So each day has a different basic, if you like, that you need to get right. What's your, what's your fundamental that you need to put in place today to get that out of the day? What's the fundamental of the next day? And what do those look like come the end of the week or come the Tuesday night when you've ultimately got to put a team out on pitch to physically work to win a football game. Um, mm. And I think, again, I personally try not to overcomplicate that. I try not to overcomplicate the work we do um, in terms of getting too fancy with different 
technologies, different things that you can obviously try and apply to your work. But if we can get those basics right without diluting any of the quality that we're trying to coach and we're trying to provide the players, I think that has a bigger effect on our work. Um, and again, use the phrase bang for buck, if you like. We use that a lot here that if we're going to put something in place to the players, well, why are we doing it? What is that going to give us that not doing it wouldn't? Yeah. Um, I feel that, again, each day is different and it, it's hard to really say one day to the next because the weeks look so different at the minute and, and with fixtures being chucked at you some Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Saturday, whatever day you might have to prepare for. In the build-up to that, have you put all those basic, I guess, uh, principles of training, principles of work into the group and that's not just a physical side of things. That could be the technical, the tactical, the recovery, the psychological. There's so many pieces of a football club that go together to produce on Saturday or, as we said, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, whatever day it might be. Have we done all the basics right? Yes, you'll need to then fine-tune your ones percents in terms of your recovery, your, your different methods that you use in terms of your rehab and, and that side of things. But... The basics, if we can get those really nailed down and really sort of good quality, I believe that gives us the best chance. Um, and again, back to your original question of priority, that would be different every day. So today, for example, my priority was we needed to expose to sprint work today. Did we do it? Yes, we did. The, yeah, the session itself was a, a tough session, big areas, high volume day. Did we do it? Yes, we did. So again, we've got our work done today that we wanted to do. Um, and that then leads us into to the next day of work, which will be Thursday. And again, we'll have a different set of priorities for that day. And at the end of it, we'll tick them off. If we'd have missed them, do we need to re, uh, revisit them on the next day of training? Do we have an opportunity to? Obviously, as the, the days to the game get, get shorter. Um, and again, those, those sort of uh, principles of our work is how we plan and how we reflect on each day. Um, try not to overcomplicate the targets of each day. Simple, simple priorities. Have we done them? Yes, no. Can we move on it and keep our, our sort of processes is moving forward? Yeah, and it's just tying those principles down, isn't it? Because then you can refer back to those constantly. So whether it's the it's the longer term plan for the season or the weekly plan, you've got your principles there and you that's that's what you're trying to tick off then, isn't it? It's basically essentially like a checklist. Yeah, that's it. Like I say, there's there's a long term plan for the season and in all honesty, that's been set out from the day we came in in pre-season. Um, I looked at a bit of the work that that Southampton have used over the last couple of years, and I think we can all agree from watching them in the Premier League that the output they have is, is pretty relentless and pretty pretty high in terms of, of how they want to play. And it's quite similar to the way we want to play here as well. And, and they use a three-week cycle, um, a sort of overload, maintenance, and an underload week. And it's something we've tried to implement this week. So... Each week we have our set targets and we then have our principles on top of that. Um, and again, it's a case of are we sticking to the plan? Um, I always think it's important to have a plan. Um, I remember being told at one point, even a bad plan is better than no plan. Um, so at <laughs> least you're all on the same page. Um, and again, that there's, I'm sure there's people that will pick, pick apart different methods we use of monitoring and different ways of, of how we do things. But ultimately, if you're all on the same page, and it's, in a way, working for you at the minute. Can you stick to it? Can you keep being consistent in what you do on a weekly basis? Then ultimately, I think you put yourself in a strong position to, to make a success of, of what you're trying to do. Obviously, the quality of player then helps. Um, but again, as far as, as, again, going back to what my remit is, are we progressing physically? Are we being able to keep players available? And are those players available because they can deal with the demands of playing football? Yeah, superb. Jake, I'll move on to some of the quick fire just to, to wrap things up. So just initially, mate, what who even are some of the biggest influences on your career so far? Um, biggest influence on my career would have to be my dad. Um, again, growing up, he was a professional player. Uh, he's been a manager and a coach since his playing career as well. And um, ultimately, I always aspired to, to have his career, if you like. Um, Again, when I was younger, little did we know he was actually studying as a, uh, for a sports science degree as well at the time. 
um, doing it alongside his playing. He's never actually gone back and, and sort of used that. Um, but again, when the more you think about it, the similarities between me and him are quite, are quite uh, strong. Um, so again, he's he's had a massive influence on me, teaching me. I guess one first of all, how to be a decent person, which I think I try and pride myself on. Um, I let other people judge that. The that goes with that um, has put me in a good position. Brilliant. And then the next one, mate, what would you say your biggest strength is as a, as a practitioner? Ooh, um, I'd like to think I'm approachable. I think uh, I like to think I, I, I build good relationships with people. Um, again, early on and probably still at the time, I have to be careful to draw the line that I'm not a player anymore. Um, and unfortunately, there is times where we can't all be mates and I have to do what my role and what my responsibilities are. But I think, um, again, <laughs> the players might tell you different, but I like to think we've, we've built up good relationships. And again, away from the club, I speak to ex-players that I've worked with and and um, and have just normal conversations that you'd have with your mates. Um, and I think that that's a, a trait that I pride myself on is I always want lads to be able to come to me with anything because if, if they can be open and honest with you, then they give you a hell of a helping hand to, to do your job to the best of your abilities. Brilliant. And then next one, what would you say is the one of the best bits of CPD you've done recently? So whether it's a webinar, whether it might be a course, might be a podcast or an article or a bit of research, is there anything um, that sort of stands out for you? Yeah, there's a couple of things. So I'm currently doing my basic supervisor experience. I'm on the process there. So I'm looking into to how I can sort of round myself off better as a, a practitioner. Um, so I've done a lot of looking into the psychological side of things. Um, the five C's I've just started sp uh, reading and, and looking over those sort of things. But I think the, the best, probably most applicable thing I've done in the past sort of six months is I did the velocity based training workshop with Chris Toombs. Oh yeah. Um, again, I don't know if, what your rules are on pushing products, but again, the, the company he works for, um, I do some workshops and it came, came to the northeast and that was a brilliant day um, yeah. and we've got the technology in the club now again I was lucky enough to be backed by the club to get that involved and I'm in the process of sort of getting all the profiling done on our players to really fine tune the work we can do when we can do it in the gym in a more regular basis um, so yeah the, the velocity based training stuff is something I'm looking at a lot at the minute um, and, and Chris was brilliant on that day. So anyone who gets the chance to, to do that sort of stuff, um, it was good. It was very hands-on. You did a lot of lifting, so <laughs> I felt the legs a little bit the day after, but no, it was a great day, and it's something that as soon as you leave that room or the wherever you do it, you've got something you can apply to your work and something that I think the, the research is suggesting is very efficient and very um, suitable for our environment, if you like, where volume isn't... Uh, something you have a lot of you you've got to make sure your work's done very precisely and very efficiently yeah yeah and then the final one mate. i know we've touched on this a little bit already but um what would you say is the most important trait for a coach to have um i think as a coach um i would like and i say being approachable is massive and being being that that good person that we've, we've talked about a little bit about being able to to differentiate the, the fact that the people we're working with still have a life away from work um, still be a decent human being, still have care for people, still have respect for people. Um, and especially in, in the role that I've got, um, that's, that's massive. But even as, as a technical coach, I see it with managers at times where you sort of think they're stepping across the line and the, the respect sometimes goes out the window. I think being respectful to people and, and the human being that's, that's actually there um, is massively important. And I think that then gets replicated in, in return. I think if you can respect them um, and you can treat them with the, the almost the dignity, if you like, of, of what, what they are, and that's a human being and a person who, who maybe I've got other stresses that are more important than football, more important than the, the line of work you're in. Um, I think that's replicated on, on behalf of the player and, and they, they have a, um, 
that has a big influence on how they then act around you. I think that that's massively important is the respect and the um, human side of things that you, you have to be aware of. Yeah, definitely. And then just a just the final one is in terms of a player. What do you think the most important trait for a player to have uh, is to have? I think the the play, players these days have to be relentless in the work work ethic. Um, I think there's so many sides of the game that have changed even since I was a player. And we're only going back 10 years there. Um, you can't just be a, a good player anymore, uh, if that makes sense. But your technical ability alone will only get you so far unless you're a, a generational talent, perhaps. Um, so the players nowadays have to have a work ethic. We, again, speaking to, to one of our lads yesterday, it's almost a selfishness that you shouldn't be ashamed if you're the last to leave training because you're doing your own gym work or you're doing your own activation or you you look getting yourself looked after because you're a bit sore. There shouldn't be a, oh, he's a busy busy sod, isn't he? It's not, it shouldn't be that. You should be a little bit selfish in what you do because ultimately the rewards there now for a player are huge. I think we all, we all know what the rewards, if you're successful as a footballer are. So you've got to be a little bit selfish, but you've got to be relentless. There's days where you don't really fancy working to 100%, but you have to because it's your job and it will only benefit you in the long term. So relentless and a little bit selfish, but at the same time, obviously, you're in a team environment. So it's learning when to be selfish, when to do your own stuff, but then when to put that into practice and be part of a bigger picture in a, in a team. Perfect. Mate, that was absolutely quality. Um, just finally, Jake, if people have got questions, they want to reach out because we've had a lot of people reaching out on the podcast saying, can we hear from coaches in League One, League Two, National League? So obviously this is a great one for um, coaches to listen to that have reached out because you've got experience in all those leagues and above. So um, in terms of if they want to drop you a message or anything like that, where's the best place they can do it? Yeah, um, like I say, I don't not massively um, over active on on social media, but I do have a Twitter, Jake Simpson. I'm not sure the full tagline, but yeah, Jake Simpson. I'm sure I'll pop up uh, on Twitter. That's something I, I keep an eye on now and again. But again, anyone who's who's open wants to have a chat with me, I'm sure if they drop you a message and I'll get you de my details over to them, not a problem, mate. No worries at all. Thanks a lot for your time, Jake. Really appreciate it, mate. And. Um... Let's hope the rest of the well, let's hope the season finishes to start with. And I'll be a start. Yeah. Hope it's a successful one for you as well. No, I appreciate that. It's been a pleasure, mate. Really appreciate that. Top man. Thanks, Jake. Yes, thank you.